Good morning, Isabel. Thank you so much for making time. It's, it's been far too long since we talked. I still remember the backdrop of your wonderful office. <laughs> and, um, and we talked just after you, you launched the Center um, by Regional Learning Center in Devon officially. And um, so much has happened since. So um, welcome to this conversation. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel. It's great to have a chance to talk. And no, normally what I, what I do before we get into the, the kind of subject areas as a way of really honoring that regenerative development starts with personal development and, mm -hmm. and then with building the capacity of a group to hold that kind of work and build a field in a region to, to um, make regeneration possible. And then you get onto the project. Um, I, I normally start with a, with a um, personal question around less so the entire biography, but more the key points in your life that took you closer to feeling like you're expressing what, what your essence or what your, what your calling is, um, which, which you're clearly doing now. Um, so um, were there any landmark points where you, where you feel or any experiences that you feel these were all the strings on, on my harp that I had to put together in order to now play it so beautifully? That is a great question. I, I think it's only by looking back that I'm able to say these were the points. And I, we were just chatting just now and I mentioned I'm writing a book and I'm realizing that all the experiences I've had to date are kind of folding themselves into the book in a quite kind of delightful way. So I suppose one of my first experiences was becoming an archaeologist and getting my hands in the soil and really understanding um, what material culture looks like. Um, I was working on a Neanderthal site in Jersey called La Cote de saint Brelard when I was 19 and 20 for the University of Cambridge dig. And it's only now by looking back that I realized that how formative an experience that was. Being able to think oneself back in time and to be part of a culture. I mean, we think Neanderthal people were unsophisticated, but evidence is showing us as archeologists sieve ever finer, how incredibly sophisticated they were and that they did have a culture. So I think that was really um, fundamental and then another experience following on from that, although at the time I never thought it was related, was working in the London art world and working as an art critic for the Times and an exhibitions curator for the Royal Academy. And realizing that um, what really fascinated me about making exhibitions or reviewing exhibitions was thinking myself back into the mind of the artist and recognizing that um, our minds shape our understanding of the world and from our understanding of the world emerges material culture. Mm -hmm. What I'd done as an archaeologist to work backwards from material culture into the mind, Neanderthal beings, homonyms, I was using in a, in a kind of other way round, looking through the other end of the telescope in a way, by working as an art curator and art critic. <clears throat> and I still bring that way of thinking to thinking about regeneration and the future and recognizing that it's within our capacity to develop our minds to the point at which we are able to see the world differently and construct our surroundings differently. So I kind of talk about the architecture of place and the way in which we inhabit place. I need to briefly inter interrupt there because this is, is, for me, this was one of my big, big learning moments when I was at Schumacher College in 2001, 2002 and, and um, thought that this new holistic science that I was studying was going to be the, the theoretical backdrop for how humanity could do things differently. And then I, then I came across, um, there were three moments. Um, once I was talking to the physicist Arthur Zions, and he, he said to me, which at the time I felt kind of disappointing, the next big change in human affairs will not come through the sciences, it will come through the arts. And it took me a long time to, to process that. But then um, I was actually given a deeper answer to that uh, shortly afterwards when, when John Todd and David Orr offered a course that, that I took part in and I suddenly woke up to the, the power of design and then spent a long time exactly on what you were just saying, this, this um, 
understanding that upstream of what most designers, classically trained designers work on, um, the product, the finished artifact or the process out there, the, if, you, if you turn around and you go into worldview and value systems and narrative and story, that, that that's really what changes human perception of the world and therefore influences our, our intentionality, our real and perceived needs, what we think we need and what we actually need. And, and that it's exactly up there in that space that you can then um, change material culture in a much more subtle way because you, you can't predict and control how interventions there will ultimately materialize, but, but you, it's the much more powerful place to, to, to influence. So I just resonate with that strongly. You wanted to highlight that. Wonderful. Yeah, well, it's lovely to hear that. I, I think it's a very exciting track to walk down I, I also studied at Schumacher College, as you know, so I was profoundly influenced by all the teachers I met there. And definitely that opened up my mind. I mean, we did everything in the course that I did from chaos theory to clowning. And that really kind of broke my, my kind of constraints around what I thought learning was, but also the way I was thinking about the world. So I think it's very important, this other thing is kind of being given permission, being given permission to think differently and do things differently. And that only happens in a group and when you're being witnessed by a group and you have a kind of a, a shared group purpose. So a lot of the work that we're doing now with regenerative design um, and place, working at bioregional scale, is working into that. How do you build collective will and how do you build shared purpose? And what are the projects that enable that to emerge? And, and what was it that, I mean, I, I looked at your bio and found out about this um, past uh, with both the Times Magazine as, as an art critic and with the RCA as an exhibition curator. And I thought, wow, what wonderful skills to, to uh, draw on to do what you're doing now. What, what was the point that, that made you say, okay, London was wonderful and creative for a while and it's time to um, do something different? I think it was 2010. 10 that you moved to Devon? Yeah, quite right. I moved here in 2010. So what happened was that I, I left the Royal Academy in 2002. <clears throat> uh, I was getting slightly tired of the London art world. It's quite uh, bubble-like. Mm -hmm. I wanted to break out of the bubble. And I, <clears throat> I had had another formative experience a long time back when I worked as an archaeologist in Jerusalem, surveying buildings around the Dome of the Rock and experiencing um, enormous generosity from people there, both Jewish and Arab people, um, but also really getting deep into um, Muslim culture. So really appreciating the cultures of Islam. And um, leaving the Royal Academy and stepping out, I was carrying with me this intention, this idea, to do something around Muslim cultures. And that grew into the Festival of Muslim Cultures that happened all through Britain, all through 2006, which taught me an enormous amount about how you work with um, different points of view around a shared purpose and a shared, shared goal. So that was an, an amazing kind of teaching experience for me. And um, after that, I, I changed the direction of my career and went much more into education and learning, which is why I went to Schumacher. And then I came down in 2010 without really intending to move here or live here or work here. It kind of happened rather spontaneously. I was selling my flat in London because it was too big and came down here for a meeting and saw a house that I loved, which is this house, and, and bought it. And that happened within a space of three days. So <laughs> it was completely unpremeditated. And then I was spent several years working out what I was supposed to do down here and worked with Transition Network for a while, heading up a couple of education programs for them, for young people and for children. And it was all the time getting more and more curious about how do you actually step up from the transition um, model, which is creating projects and working with communities. How do you step it up to work with a whole region and work systemically? Yeah. So that's yeah. Again, this is, this is I, I, I'm just always appreciating when, when I have conversations with people where there are these wonderful parallels in, 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 in story. Like I, because I, I had that same, like, um, I spent a long time with the, with the Global Eco Village Network, lived at Findhorn for four years, um, 
when when the whole transition town thing started, um, I I helped to um, set up the transition town in Forest and and gave one of the first talks in Germany on on transition towns, but but through my experience of of looking at different eco villages around the world and and working with transition towns, I had by the time that I left Scotland in 2010 and moved to Mallorca, I I had got to that point of realizing that there is something mistaken in believing that like, yes, of course, small is beautiful. Yes, of course, community scale where people have a face and a name really matters for true participation and, and transforming the world. It, it happens in place with people that know each other. Yeah. But on a whole systems design integration scale, a community of a few thousand people, even a town like Totnes of eight, eight or 10,000 people, doesn't have, and that's where economics of scale does exist, but not in the kind of neoliberal way of making it bigger, how do we scale it up indefinitely, but there is a sort of economics of scale that demands a regional approach. And, and also going into our human history, we've been a bioregional species for most of our, um, our species history, as, as you well know as an um, uh, anthropology uh, archaeologist you did, you, yeah. yes. and and um it's precisely that the, when i like already at findhorn i helped start something that was called the building bridges program and and even got my first grant to run finhorn college um through a local like a regional development grant of the of, of the highlands region um and and I, I try to tell them, like, look, if you need to take your gift not just to the international people that come and visit Findhorn, you need to integrate it into the wider bioregion. And, and coming to Mallorca was really because I'd been studying bioregionalism ever since I came across it at Schumacher College in 2002, um, wrote about it in my master's thesis in, in quite some detail. But what I bumped into then, which is which you're probably quite familiar with, is that one of the reasons why there's often been this slow uptake of this conversation is that people get very stuck on defining the regional boundaries and how do you define what is actually our bioregion and and is it really this map or is it this map and um, and can we stick to the watershed of this river or do we need to expand it and like th these conversations and. And to avoid them, when when things started to transpire that Mallorca was calling me, I, I suddenly thought, how brilliant, an island. Nobody can argue about the dimensions <laughs> of the bioregion on an island. And um, of course, I've learned since that that's not entirely true, because now we're having a pretty strong discussion here, a positive discussion about whether working here in the Balearics is actually the Balearic bioregion of the four islands and the sea between it, giving us the huge opportunity to look at a marine and terrestrial regeneration effort in a, in a joint way. Um, and, and then, as, as you know, places fractal, then, then sort of have different bioregional in initiatives on each island, but, but to do so as a, as a, as a bioregion of islands. Um, so yeah, it's it's fascinating that that again there's another beautiful um, parallel in our learning journey um, to, yes. to see that it's the regional scale that really matters. I agree, it's the regional scale. So we define our bioregion by water. Mm -hmm. So we think our bioregion goes from the River Tamar, which divides Devon and Cornwall, to the River Teen to the east. I the River Teen marks the kind of um, passage into East Devon. And then in the south, we've got the sea, so that's nice and easy. And in the north, we've got where all our rivers rise on Dartmoor. We've got five very fast flowing rivers that come off the moor and flow then kind of more slowly and gradually down to the sea. I, and how did we come up with that definition? I think that, um, well, I know that working with the Regenesis Group and Regenerative Design really helps me um, create a framework for that by asking how big is here? And really simple questions like, what do you feel when you leave the place that you know is your home? What does it feel like to go over that hill? And kind of when we go over Halden Hill and then we kind of descend Exeter in East Devon, there's a very different sensation, a different feeling. And uh, maybe that's not very scientific, but it's kind of, it's a, it's a truly felt sense of, of inhabiting place. 
and so that's what we're working with and it's it's very aligned with the with the kind of um i, I always hesitate to call them the, the early wave of bioregionalists because of the fact that that most indigenous cultures were by regionalists and yeah. even if they na didn't name it that way but people like peter burke and raymond desmond and and, and that american manifestation of bioregionalism yes. in the 60s and 70s um peter burke i think it was who, who said that it's not just the terrain a geo geographic terrain it's a terrain of consciousness and what you were just describing is a beautiful example of that terrain of consciousness of, of crossing the hill and suddenly feeling familiar but not quite home uh, and, and why yes. is that? Uh. Yes, no, absolutely. And of course we play with it and it's a fuzzy boundary. So we're not being didactic at all. And we're also working at different scales according to which shed we're working in. So we work in water sheds, fiber shed, food shed and so on, energy shed. And they all have different scales. They have meaning at different scales. So we, we find ourselves kind of, you know, having to be quite loose and relaxed about thinking, well, right now we're just not quite working in South Devon, we're working in the whole of Devon. For instance, we're leading the creation of a donut for Devon, Cape Ray wow. Donut Economics, yeah. because there's energy around that and people want to make it happen. And we see this as a wonderful opportunity to um, really understand more about how you create kind of collective will towards a shared goal and how you bring many different stakeholders together with different um, needs for different kinds of donuts, but wanting to kind of align them around a single donut, and then we'll have mini donuts spreading out from that. Again, fractal, sounds great. Yeah, it's all yeah. fractal, exactly. And, and um, before I, uh, because it, you, I'm, I'm curious to learn more about how you got to the we you just spoke to. Um, but I've also, like when I was looking at your, your um, bio, I, I realized, I, actually I was looking at the, the website of the Bioregional Learning Center and it, and it mentioned a module with the University of Plymouth in 2015 on bioregional design. Mm -hmm. and, and as far as I understand, that's predating the, the, the creation of the actual Bioregional Learning Center. Um, how, when, when did you active bioregionally focused work start and and how how because has is this module still continuing or was that just a one one off thing it was a one off module hmm. uh, well done for discovering that yeah. <laughs> i can't remember when we, when we did that but it might be in 2015 something yeah like that's that. that's what it says on the website okay so when did the whole thing start good question I suppose in my mind it started at least eight years ago mm -hmm. and without me even being aware that what I was doing was thinking bioregionally or wanting to work bioregionally and um, then just kind of various bits of information came into my ken and for instance there was um, a bioregional short course led by Patrick Sale at Schumacher College back in 1992 I think it was mm -hmm. a long time ago and um, Rob Hopkins alerted me to this. And I searched high and low in Schumacher for any record of the course, and there was nothing. And then I discovered that there had been a mini publication, and I found it in the Totnes um, archive. The, the kind of, our town has a little archive, and I found it there. So then I kind of reproduced it and then shared it back with Schumacher. But anyway, um, bioregional thinking was coming into being probably in 2014. 2015, uh, my colleague Jane and I taught that course. It wasn't until um, 2017, almost exactly four years ago, that we constituted ourselves at the Bioregional Learning Centre. And that was partly because in May, June of 2016, John Thackera and Pamela Mangel Glansberg from Regenesis and I taught this short course at Schumacher College called Bioregioning by Design. And we ran a design charrette at the end of the two weeks and invited people from the local area to do a design charrette, to be part of a design charrette around food and local food systems. And at the end of it, um, two people who I knew a bit but didn't know very well came up to me and said, we've just got to do this, we've got to make it happen. And I thought, yes, let's make it happen. I have no idea how we're going to make it happen, but let, just let's do it. And they were um, Jane Brady and... Nick Paling, and Nick Paling's an ecologist with West Country Rivers Trust, and Jane's an extremely talented graphic designer. 
and we are still the team that runs the whole center. Um, so that, that's how we got to where we are now. Great, and I, I also, because I was really, like one of the things that I feel would really help move this conversation along here on New Yorker is to, to let myself be inspired by the, the project that you did with the bioregional learning journey and, and um, doing something similar here on, on Mallorca. Like I, when, when I first came to Mallorca 10 years ago, I thought I was going to use the, the beauty of the landscape. Um, I've, I've done a lot of kind of work that reconnects um, using council in nature, doing yeah. solo times and all that to open up people's inner space in order to then be open to new inspiration and, and new ways of thinking. And, and I, I thought I was gonna run sort of manager trainings do, doing workshops along the Tramontana, still hasn't happened. But I, I've, for, for a while now I've been, the, the pandemic has kind of short circuited that a bit, but I've been thinking it would be so lovely to take people on a tour to actually be able to experience um the geology and the, the 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 hydrology and the flora fauna but also experience these these um in spanish you say brotes the the um the budding mm. projects all over the place that are actually expressions of bioregional regeneration but when you just look at one project you you, you kind of say well lovely project uh, creative individual doing beautiful stuff but but it's it's actually when you see that they they are in touch with each other some of them some of them don't know about each other and, and it's more and more i'm realizing that <clears throat> part of working by regionally is making the systems the system visible to itself um and and introducing the different actors to a larger story where they can actually see themselves and their contribution over often a long time background in a new light because you re restory these individual storyline into a tapestry that says this isn't even and, and it's so aligned with um the, the regenesis way of working of um place sourced um it's actually understanding that these budding projects are expressions of the land expressing itself and its essence and that, that the people are just the the way of of letting the land come through them which would ultimately be the the the, 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 the holy grail of re-inhabitation is that we are expressions of the the land and not um the other way around uh, i completely agree daniel it was a really powerful experience running that learning journey i mean for one thing we reached out to a huge number of people in order to organize it and invite people to come on it that in itself was a very good thing to have done, but just kind of getting out onto the land and, and seeing what's going on, what we call the green shoots of resilience, and connecting them up and kind of taking stories from one place to the next and really appreciating what these people were doing. I think that's really important too, kind of witnessing and appreciating and um, creating a story around that, a comprehensive um, story that has some kind of coherence. For me, more and more, um, the whole concept of bio bioregions and, and how to work within them is to create a coherent story. And I think in a world that you know is becoming increasingly fractured, it appears to be falling apart, we seem to be kind of floundering. We we lack coherent stories. I think to kind of gift ourselves a coherent story is it was a really powerful thing to do. And there's also something really good about getting out outdoors and addressing issues outdoors, whether it's you know, challenges around drinking water supply or looking in our case at how the sea was destroying um, a particular coastal road that will not be rebuilt when the next storm comes because there won't be money in the system to rebuild it. Do you kind of get outside and bring many people together discussing out of doors, something rather magical happens, like people don't become adversarial. They, they kind of tend to, to move towards a shared position. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, and it's the, the the when when I was looking at the bioregional learning journey, um, and then recently I had a com um, uh, quick email exchange with him. 
Glenn Page popped up as one of your collaborators on that. And yeah. I know Glenn through, through other work, through the International Futures Forum, and of yeah. course through his involvement with, with the Regenerative Communities Network and, and him being a friend of, of Stuart Cohen and so on. And um, so how, how did that come about and in, in, in what way did, did, did Glenn play a role in, in helping with the learning journey? Well, Glenn is someone with tremendous positive energy. So he kind of put the boot in and said, you've got to do this. <laughs> uh, how did we meet Glenn? I think we were introduced by a mutual friend some time back and um, had very um, lively conversations by Zoom. And um, we had thought of doing a learning journey, but it was Glenn who really said, you know, have you thought about this, doing, doing this seriously, making it happen? And um, he got us on track to make it happen. Then he wonderfully came over and was part of the journey. So he was kind of taking photographs and keeping the energy high and, and helping us reflect each day. So the piece he brought was the kind of the systemic reflection part. Like, what did we see? What, what did it mean for our systems? And he, as you may know, he's very interested in kind of um, eco timelines. So looking at how ecology has been influenced by man and man has been influenced by climate change and changing ecologies over centuries if not millennia so he also brought that piece along yeah, that, that that reminds me of another dimension well two, two things about glenn like one one thing that i found hugely fascinating talking to him about because he has this company called sustainer matrix and he's been yeah. very much involved in in trying to um find new ways of evaluation that um, that aren't stuck in the um, dogma of what gets measured gets managed um, in a in a sort of only quantifiable, statistically significant, measurable aspects of the system can count to into our management process. Because I think that's part of why we're in such a mess. That that that, that that's the current dogma. And and I feel like he's really trying to push the boundaries on how do we include the fuzzy relationship, qualitative, um, story-based, subtle aspects of evaluating systems change and yes. transformation. And, and uh, I, I mean, he, he's the one who put me onto this book, which I'm, I'm sure you've, you've um, yes. also um, had him talk, talk about. Yeah. So, yeah. And no, it, it, he's, he's, he's wonderful. Um, and, and now I'm missing where I was planning well, to go. Yes, this ability to measure, yeah, yeah. measure systemic change. That's incredibly important. I mean, it's not only important so that you can understand how impactful your interventions in the bioregion are and what, where, do, where do you need to go next, but I mean, funding is pretty crucial to all this as well. So being able to take funders on a journey with you and, and show them this is how change happens if you work systemically. I think that's one of the one of what well, seems to be one of the big challenges we have is that funders are not entirely comfortable with funding systems change because uh, it's not a clear project, it's not linear. You can't always say what you're going to exactly deliver on. You can kind of present a tra trajectory that you're working down and working towards, and you can say these things are likely to happen because of these actions. But I. I'm also very aware that we're working in an emergent way and um, we're putting kind of disparate pieces of the jigsaw puzzle back together and who knows what's going to spark from those new connections. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that, that's a, the whole issue about how to fund these projects is, is an, another big one. Like in the last few years, like for example, through my, my role with the Lush Spring Prize on the jury of the Spring Prize, I, I had this wonderful opportunity together with the other 12 judges to look at amazing social and ecological regeneration projects around the world. Many of them at a kind of community or maybe regional scale. Um, many of them by organizations that don't manage massive budgets, but do amazing work with very little in the global south, for example. And, and through that, the, when, when, when I realized, how do we, how can we bring more money than this wonderful 11 prizes to totaling up to 210,000 that, that Lush has put up to these projects. Because basically by the time we got to see projects, there were 200, 300 entries and the judges got to see about 40, 45 of them. Mm -hmm. And bar two or three that, that 
somehow slipped through the due diligence pro process but had something fishy about them, all the other ones were worth funding and, and we were lamenting, why can't we fund more of them? And then as I, as I tried to help them build a, a new way of, that isn't based on a zero sum win, lose, gain the price, or invest lots of money applying and then get the dampener of uh, a lot of time and staff time and energy applying. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, just get the dampener of saying, wonderful, you were a runner up, but you're not getting any money, which, yeah. which I've also seen from the inside with some of the organizations I've been working with. Um, I, we, we were looking at the funding world and realized that there's two really big dysfunctionalities in the, in the funding world. One, one is that the large funds in order to make it easier for themselves, consider 500,000 euros or pounds or dollars, a small grant. Yes. And, and they're one, like you, what, what could the bioregional learning center do if somebody came along and said, we're gonna give you 50,000 every year for the next 10 years. Yeah, we can do very, that. very different than, than somebody coming and saying, we're gonna give you 500,000. You probably would change what you're doing and, and, and it might even, jeopardize what you're nurturing in this emergent way to suddenly get a windfall like that. But getting that smaller money or other projects, just even the one or two off grant or 50 grand would make all the difference for them to step up their effectiveness. Yes. And so, I don't know if you've seen it, but if you go to um, regenerosity.world, um, mm. you, you should, you should um, get in with them. That's what grew out of this process. It's a, it's a, it's a platform that tries to help large funders to, to basically give to this platform. And then the platform gives rather than one 500,000 gives more smaller grants to many organizations in order mm -hmm. to pulverize this, this impasse. And, and the, and the other um, big dysfunctionality of the funding world and also the, the academic um, research grant world is that for some bizarre reason, we're calling it investigation or systems change, but people want what's going to happen in 10 years or in five years time at the end of the project before you even started. They want, <laughs> what are the outcomes going to be? Well, um, we don't know yet. We're starting a journey of collective learning and exploration. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, like, I mean, you, you can try saying it out clearly, but, but it, in most cases, it just gets you struck off the list of potential um, you can award it yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a conundrum. I'm not quite sure how to solve this one. Yeah. But I'm sure there are some funders out there who feel excited about going on a journey. They don't have to invest a huge amount. As you've said, you know, £50,000 a year for five years would make all the difference to the work that we can do. We can then start to intervene in all the systems that we have here, whether it's tourism or agriculture or health or energy or whatever to create a kind of coherent story about where we're heading in terms of climate resilience. And we, we need neutral organizations who can do that work. Exactly, I mean, that's the, like, again, 10 years of, of in some way experimenting with this notion of how as an individual can I um, nurture positive emergence in a complex dynamic system that is fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable yeah. without yeah. the arrogance that I can change the island of Mallorca, but with a subtle kind of who do I weave together? What information flows do I yes. curate in order for people to meet around certain narratives? Um, what weaving can I do? The, these, I've, I've seen the effectiveness of this subtle approach, this sort of systemic yeah. Aikido or acupuncture, but again, it, it's, it's a role that on the one hand is effective because people can't really place you because you're coming in without an yes. economic agenda, without a sort of what's, what's in it for you. You're a Mallorca. Sometimes people then go, Hmm, this guy must be clever because I can't see what's in it for him. And, and then they distrust you for that rather than believing that you're actually doing it for the common good. But, but um, it, it's such an important role, this role of the weaver. Yes. And, and it's so often not appreciated. And, and really what I saw appreciated when you set up the center is the learning in the center name. Um, yeah. it, it carries a huge amount of wisdom because it, it, it puts out there from the beginning that you're not like 
the go-to resource to tell people what to do in their region. You, you are the place where people can learn more about, like anybody ready to start the long journey of re-inhabitation and, and being an active participatory member in creating co-creating a better future for that region can join a learning center on, on, a, on a kind of equal face-to-face -face view. So, so I commend you for that. Uh, Oh, thank you, Daniel. Yes, we are heading towards creating a learning region mm -hmm. and the learning center is serving the learning region. Mm -hmm. But to go back to what you were saying, I think it's really important. It is one of our missions to professionalize this role, professionalize the role of the person who or the organization that steps forward to, well, it is in a leadership role to lead systemic change. And I, I think back to um, the Stanford Innovation Center did a lot of work around collective um, impact and backbone organizations, which we've been inspired by. And the role of the center to become a kind of a neutral trusted player. And what we see, I think you also just referring back to a slightly earlier question, like how do you do this? How do you build all these networks? How do you pull all these people together? Well, I think it's partly through kind of place sourced, um, what's what's already there in the place like where where is the impetus going where do people want to go what's the direction that's kind of emerging now so just to kind of give the example of, of creating the donut for devon there was a, a very good event here in devon i think it was in july online um, which called together a, a, lots of different um, organizations combined to put the event on mainly people working in the space of kind of new economy uh, social justice, um, agroecology, and so on. A lot of new thinking was in that space. But Kate Rayworth recorded um, a talk about making donuts, especially for Devon. And when that was shown, there was a huge amount of kind of energy and activity and chat saying, we want to do this. And so then we knew that um, our, our route map for moving our bioregion forward started with the the learning journey, and then moved through creating a core team around um, the whole strategy for South Devon, we knew that we needed to have some kind of collective process. We weren't quite sure what it was, but in fact, the process of making the donut for Devon is now, in a sense, kind of morphing into that process. And then from that, we want to create some kind of distributed organization, which is able to hold a shared strategy. And at the end of the making of the donut, we plan for some kind of summit, a Devon Donut Summit, perhaps, at which we bring a lot of different stakeholders together. You know, people from the business world, from academia, from governance, from civil society, community groups, from farming, from fishing, tourism, and so on, into a room. We hope by that stage we can be in a real room and collectively kind of design some strategy to move forward that actually works knowing that everybody has a slightly different interpretation of what climate resilience is and need to do something slightly different for their se sector or their organization or whatever you might want to call it. But something then holds the whole thing together. So a lot of what we do is act as glue. Mm. And we kind of keep on thinking, well, how do we manufacture better glue to stick this all together? It's, it's fascinating um, because, what, like, when was it? 2000 and was it 19 or? Yeah, it must have been 19. Um, I went to uh, Rotterdam for the conference of the Reporting 3.0 network that, that then at the conference kind of they rebranded to R3.0, which is redesign, re, um, regeneration and, and resilience. Mm -hmm. um, after starting off more as, as an organization that, that wanted to tr transform reporting within large corp corporations they sort of realized that they actually curated a much wider, much more innovative network that was beyond mm. just that goal. And at, at that event, um, it was an amazing group of speakers they pulled together and, and um, Kate was there and, and Nora Bateson was there as well. Mm. And um, it was there that, that I heard Kate for the very first time speak about what was called the Thriving Places Project that she yeah. initially started off with Janine Benyus um, and and funded through the C40 network, and mm -hmm. and 
she already spoke about her first prototypes of the work in, in I think it was Portland, Pittsburgh and Amsterdam. Yeah. That she did the first workshops using the donut and the citrus as sort of thinking tools. Mm -hmm. And um, and she came afterwards, uh, she, she came came up and, and, and said that she would, would have would love to have lunch and, and explore um, what I thought about this strategy. And mm. one of my feedbacks back then, and Nora joined us as well for, for that wonderful lunch, um, was that I could see why she had focused on the city scale, because it was funded by the C40 network. But I sort of reminded her of, of Patrick Geddes and Cities in Evolution, and that, that the really wise city planners have known for a 100 years you cannot plan a city without planning it in the context of its region. And that, that I loved the whole thriving places approach. But the one thing that if there is one thing that I, I would have a sour grapes with or a suggestion of how to make it even more powerful is to foreground city regions or even bioregionalism and then slightly background the city. I understand that that's where all the attention, all the money is going. But again, it's a narrative thing. If we keep telling the narrative that humanity's future is urban, then we're going to create a world that, that, that mm -hmm. attempts to make that so. But what we're realizing now with the UN decade of ecosystems restoration and also with, with, with the um, COVID disruptions on large supply chains is that, that we actually would create much more, for, for an uncertain future, we would create much more nested resilience through nested um, redundancies if we paid more attention to providing for cities within the context of the region. And I, I find that particularly the, the, the horror of the Trump administration's um, undoings of things for four years um, shows that, like, we probably both heard this line growing up that America's future, uh, get present is our future. Certainly in Germany, that was for a long time a lemma. Uh, and if, uh, if we want to avoid running into that kind of demagoguery future, we need to heal the relationship between cities and regions, between um, somewhat abandoned rural population that feel disenfranchised and feel like they're not being heard. And again, bioregionalism or a thriving regions approach, a la the donut, is, is exactly where it's at. And again, hats off that you're taking the donut to Devon because it's a bioregional donut. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think in many ways, this bioregional work that we're doing is kind of reevaluating the rural. And in our bioregion, we have Plymouth, which is a city, and we have Torbay, which is an urban area. And we have a lot of um, rural as well. I, I was going to say hinterland, but that's absolutely the wrong way of looking at it. They're equally important. And so, yes, kind of how we get them all to work together is one of the challenges. And you're right, it's about telling a new story. So a new story of place. So we know, for instance, that for our cities to be regenerative, they need to embrace more nature within them. And Kate Rayworth and Janine Benyus would both say that and point to that. And to kind of integrate the, the rural and the urban. So just to give you a kind of mini story from our learning journey. So one of the places we went to was Plymouth on the learning journey. And we met a lot of social enterprises and heard about shocking poverty in Plymouth. I mean, really shocking. And the... Um, the situation with food poverty and food deserts in Plymouth. And then the next day we went to talk to farmers on Dartmoor and, and kind of relayed the information that we'd um, experienced or, or come to see in Plymouth to the farmers. And they said, is there any way that we can um, give our meat or, or have our meat taken into Plymouth so that we can meet the, the needs of the people there who are suffering from food poverty? So it's kind of, it, how do you make those connections? It, it comes back to the weaving. And it comes back, I think, a lot to personal relationships as well. So building relationships of trust is incredibly important. It's, it's, this reminds me of a, like quite, quite a few years ago, I was working for a local, um, like with some kind of European grant, a series of business clusters were set up on Mallorca in 2006 before I got here. Um, and they were basically sector specific, like there was a, biomedical cluster and there was a chemical industry cluster and there was a tourism technological innovation cluster and in that cluster 
employed me as the, the, the sustainability project activator, so to say, like in, in a weaver kind of role. But again, their budget only held to me being paid for one day a month, which of course isn't enough to, to really do very much. And my, my capacity to add another four or five days pro bono um, ran out after a few years of working with them. But, but one of the projects was connecting, tr trying to connect the hotel industry and other members of this cluster, like a large um, kitchen that was providing meals for, for hospitals and large canteens and a couple of schools, to local producers. Um, to just start simple little things like add a bit more local almonds or make desserts with, um, with uh, algarroba, um, um, carob. Uh, as a chocolate because it gets gets produced here and you can make lovely carob desserts and um and it, it's it's really fascinating because on the one hand systemically you can see how much sense that makes mm -hmm. um, and then when you actually get into applying it it also you bump into these strange off-scale um systems we've created so for mm -hmm. example that the local almond cooperative for a while had to send like they was they were milling the almonds like into almond ground almonds on yeah. the island, but then in large containers they shipped it to the mainland to then get get them packaged in half half um, kilo and kilo bags to then get them sent back to Mallorca uh, and <laughs> and 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 they were so in this role that that it took ages to even get. Like I was trying to give them new markets here locally, and and it, it took a long time to to actually get the project off the ground. But um, that, but that's why these weaver roles are so so important. And and it it also reminds me of because I wanted to come back to this when when you mentioned Glenn Page earlier and his eco timelines. Um, what what I've and I, I want to come to your book in a minute because I, it's wonderful that I just found out that you're writing a book on bioregioning because um, I've, I'm also working on um, something that I, maybe I should put the word island in the title now, knowing that, <laughs> that you're, you're writing one as well. Um, because it's been in the making for the last two years, um, sort of how do, we, how do we foreground the bioregional aspect of co-creating regenerative cultures. My, my book was all about diverse regenerative cultures everywhere on the globe, cr mm -hmm. created through people living the question, being on a learning journey rather than having the answers. Um, but but I, I realized since I, the book came out that really it is that um, bioregional work that, that I need to foreground even mm -hmm. more, and, and mm -hmm. so, so I'm, I'm, I'm also writing about that. And, and one of the things that I, for, for that, have a very strongly, like having looked at all the resilience work that Holling and Gundersen and all these, like the, the, the early Resilience Alliance scientists have done, that, that started off looking at change in ecosystems, then very quickly realized that there weren't really any ecosystems that weren't affected by human um, in influence, like the, the whole yeah. Anthropocene meme. Um, and so then used this academic term, socio-ecological systems, that, that at least invited us to put humans back into the system rather than have this false separation of nature and culture. But when you, when you look at these two graphics, the, the adaptive cycle, um, and then the nestedness of adaptive cycles, the panarchy uh, of the local, the regional, and the global. Yeah. They, they invite us into, um, and I had, had this as a core theme, um, actually taking the word from Stuart Cohen and, 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 and Sim van der Rim from, from their book, Ecological Design, mm -hmm. um, this notion of that we need scale linking designs. Yes. And, and that we need to pay attention of how, how if place is fractal, how does this place sit in this region, sit in this nation, and sit yeah. in, in the biosphere? And, and we need a much more nuanced conversation than the sort of parochial bioregionalism of let's all pull together and create a lifeboat for difficult times and climate collapse and, and yeah. all that, the, the, the sort of somewhat panicky deep adaptation approach, mm -hmm. um, rather than, than to, 
to say, no, we need to have a nuanced conversation of what we can enliven and enrich by becoming more local and regional and what national and global collaboration we need to enable that true subsidiarity this this kind of we won't have bioregional culture if we don't have a reshifting of the political process towards subsidiarity um, that that all national and international um, forms of governance enable and are subsidiary to local and regional self-governance and participation and also a re regionalization or relocalization of economic patterns that again doesn't mean we don't want international trade but we yeah. we want local people to be able to be supplied locally because that's the most resilient way of both taking care of the ecosystem and taking care of the people living there and and so what 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 i more and more if i had to give an analysis of what's wrong with our current degenerative patterns for humanity is that it, we're out of scale with, and this this is as a biologist speaking, who's spent ages, like I did a PhD on human and planetary health and understanding the nested wholeness of how at the systemic biomimicry level, we can learn from life, how life creates healthy systems in this nested way and how it doesn't grow cells that are the size of an elephant, mm. but but keeps, cell dividing and then creating symbiotic organisms or, or entities like an organ sitting within a nested wholeness of a human body sitting within a family sitting within a community and so on and and so um for me really this this notion of how do we enable the bioregional scale to get to to be the healing element that can help people to come back to place and do so in, I love Mitchell Tomashaw's uh, work, cosmopolitan bioregionalism, because <laughs> to do so in a way that is truly in global solidarity, because what, I don't know if you've come across this in Devon yet, but I have come across this in a couple of places, also here in Catalonia, or in, in, on Mallorca and in Catalonia, mm -hmm. is that there's a new flourishing of a bioregional conversation that from, comes from a co to my bias questionable side of the political spectrum it's actually quite ultra right protectionism our region a, a sort of dark side underbelly yes. of the bioregional meme yeah. that says we can close borders and keep all of them out and we'll be fine just here yeah? yes. and 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 i think we we have a responsibility as, as people who are who are flying the bioregional flag to 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 um to address that both on the scale issue and and that kind of dark underbelly what, what are your reflections mm, very good i what do i think about that i think that it's very easy to politicize what we're doing i i'm concerned about that so i think one has to from the get-go and i'm very glad you're writing a book because the more attention we bring to bioregioning the better um, I think from the get-go, we need to kind of um, make the case for bioregions being where a huge amount of innovation is already starting to happen, an innovation that kind of points the way to the future. Um, how to, in a fragmented world, I see, I see us kind of bioregioning as offering a kind of coherence and a scale for human organizing in a fragmented world. I guess that's where I'm coming from and also see a huge role for civil society within that. But we can't address the issues that we're facing now around climate change and species loss, et cetera, et cetera, without involving um, the whole of our societies. I mean, not everybody's going to have the capacity or the desire to get involved, but certainly the invitation needs to be there. So I think that in order for that to happen, and I'm sure you thought about this too, there's, uh, there is quite a lot that needs to shift. I mean, governance would need to shift. And one of the beauty of working bi-regionally is you don't have to work politically. You can kind of create your own non-political boundaries for doing this work, um, but not in opposition to the existing governance structures, but kind of as complementing it and recognizing this is a kind of, this is the scale at which things really start to happen. But then as we've already, already kind of mentioned, there's a need to kind of rethink financing. There would be a re need to kind of rethink how 
so many of our life support systems, you know, whether it's kind of food or water or whatever, that currently sit in these um, siloed sectors, how do we get them to talk to each other? So that's part of the work of the Bioregional Learning Centre is to kind of enable those conversations to happen. So we start kind of mixing things up and getting people in energy talking to people in fishing or people in waste talking to people in, in tourism, for instance. And part of what the donut is helping us do is also create a baseline, which everybody in Devon will be able to kind of see and relate to. It's not necessarily telling us precisely what to do once we've got that baseline. It's pointing us in a particular direction. So there's a piece of work to do to kind of imagine all the projects that could happen and the ways in which we could link up to make them work. So um, I'm, I'm feeling very positive about bioregioning as being um, a driver of change. Um, I think part of our work is advocacy and training and enabling people to learn from what we're doing. I, yeah, so a bi-regional learning centre here in South Devon, part of the purpose of the book is to tell the story of South Devon. So South Devon becomes in conversation with other bi-regions around the world. So we would love to talk to Mallorca, for instance, and put that into the book. But it's also um, doing the work on the ground, moving the whole bi-regional project forward and learning from it and being the kind of um, sharers of that learning and then eventually kind of offering training in how to do this. How do you, how do you lead this work? How do you do systems change at region wide scale? So not systems change that's kind of at an abstract scale. It's not about systems in terms of kind of global food systems. It's very much bringing it back to earth and saying, let's just do it here. Let's see how we can make it work and let's not make it too complicated. Let's do it in a way that anyone anywhere could pick up and start to use. Yeah, the, one, one thing that I found myself quoting a lot is a um, conversation that I had with Bill Reed at the beginning of last year, um, when in a side sentence really, he said to me, Daniel, you can't heal the planet, but you can heal places. Yes. And, and it sort of stuck with me and, 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 and developed more and more nuances and more and more depth that, that one sentence um, over, over the, since then. And, um, and, and it made me realize that, that that's precisely where things stop being theoretical or abstract or conceptual, um, where they become real. When, when, you, when you, through application in place, begin to start the journey of how, how do we do this in a way that we create whole systems health? And, and that, that wonderful Regenesis question, what is it in service of this, this notion of nested wholeness of, of saying, even if we work at the local or the bioregional scale, how, how does this sit in this local um, contribution to what we now call to do, which is to, to fundamentally redesign the human presence on earth within a lifetime of the generations alive today in mm -hmm. ways that regenerate and restore our ecosystems, but also regenerate and restore our societies, our communities, our way mm -hmm. of being with each other. And, and um, yeah, that's, that, that's the journey we're on. Um, it, it's for, for me the the and we I think we talked about this the first time and last time we, we spoke um, because it was somehow we connected around the regenerative communities network and I had this conversation yes. a lot with Stuart Cohen when they set up where I, I I realized that they were really energetic trying to get all these budding bioregional projects around the world yes. in conversation with each other so they could learn from each other. And, and because of my own particular point um, in life at the time, I, I felt a real strong, like on the one hand, I wanted to be part of this conversation. Um, and, and they kept saying, you should register Mallorca as one of the places to be part of this network. And I was like, yeah, but who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm a foreigner here on Mallorca. I don't feel like the, the right that I can register Mallorca at, at, as such. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and I also felt, or at least yet, because I felt like I hadn't organized the local grounding of it in a way that it wouldn't be me, but it would be a collective that did so. And um, and I I also felt at that point a real tension, and I still feel it um, between doing the global work. So so our bioregional approach is cosmopolitan and learns from each other across the globe and supports each other and tells a narrative that 
funders all around the globe can begin to see, wait a minute, this is not a weird project in, in, in South Devon. This is, this is an impulse and a leading impulse, one of the real pioneers of yeah. something that is starting to bud everywhere around the globe. Yeah. And it's doing so in a very structured and beautiful way. Like the minute you, you, you put the context of the bioregional learning center you set up into that global context and significance, it's much more attractive to funders and it makes all other projects that are likewise also more attractive. Uh, and and so, so that, that's important, clearly. And also the learning is important. But then I thought, do I really want to sit on lots of Zoom calls where somebody rabbits on about how they had tr troubles in Costa Rica talking to the bamboo grower because of blah, 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 and the local governments pulled the funding on da, da, da. And, and of course, great. Yeah, but... Yeah. To what extent, where do I put my effort and how do we balance the global connectivity with the local action and the local groundedness and the, co the, the, the deep conversations that take time with neighbors, with farmers, with fishermen, with like, um, and how do you live that, that weighing of the global and the local in, in your bioregional work there? Well, we are a part of regenerative communities network. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say, I get pulled between these two modes of working. Mm -hmm. So um, for the last eight, 10 months, I've been really focusing on South Devon. I'm just emerging from South Devon to have more international conversations. And I recognize that both are important, but I have to put South Devon first. You know, unless we can show that it really works here. I, and, and coming back to what you were saying about um, regenerating places, so, as you know, a lot of the principles behind regenerative design are enabling places to regenerate themselves and kind of figuring out what are the intervention points that we can, what are the kind of acupuncture pressure points that we can activate in order to enable those regions to regenerate. And a lot of it's to do with people. Of course, it's to do with people and forming those um, relationships with people. So I, I think it's perfectly possible to get completely overwhelmed with being in too many relationships all at once. So I have to say number one is South Devon. Mm, yeah, no, that's, I think that's the, the wisdom that I'm, I mean, now, now that I'm also becoming the custodian of a piece, piece of land that we're moving on to, um, it, 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 I, it's opening up a whole nother dimension of re-inhabitation, yeah. li living once, once talk um, that, that seems, very promising at this stage in, in the journey. Then I just wanted to get back to what, one thing earlier about the, the donut for Devon. Um, at that conference that I mentioned, I, one of the projects that, that we dreamt up over that lunch with, with Nora and with Kate was um, like here on Mallorca, a bioregional change would have to come or at least include strongly the tourism industry as the the catalytic engine of change um, yeah. and in 2019 I was starting to re-enter after this the earlier um, work with the tourism industry that I mentioned through that cluster I was yeah. starting to re-enter and reanimate my old connections to to have this conversation with the tourism industry here on Mallorca to say look you've exported a a, a model of tourism uh, to the world that the, the all-inclusive ma mass tourism that, that was extremely successful, but um, it's also had a lot of very, very destructive side effects in a lot yeah. of places, very often beautiful places that then also got terrib uh, terribly addicted to tourism as the main economic driver of the region. And Mallorca is an example of it. Like, depending on how you count it, 60% direct and 80% indirect um, of, of the local economy um, is is tourism and tourism providers and um, and so I, I started through a number of talks um, this, this wonderful woman called Anne Pollock from Con Conscious Travel um, yes, we've talked to Anne. she's been enormously helpful to us she's amazing and, then, <laughs> and she had she'd managed to convince the region of Flanders to yeah. rethink travel and she invited uh, Rob Hopkins and and um, uh, Andrew Sims and Michelle Holiday and me to to be the keynote speakers at a tourism conference. <laughs> None of the three of us are tourism professionals in, in our main day job, and and um, I could use that then to bring that into the Mallorcan conversation. 
And so right around the time that I had this conversation with, with Nora and Kate, we were dreaming up bringing both, like bringing Kate's Thriving Places methodology mm -hmm. together with Nora's warm data lab approach, together mm -hmm. with the bioregional frame um, that the, uh, the Capital Institute and, and, and I am and others are, are holding. Um, and then also adding on Anna Pollock's work as having somebody in the room who's already actively rethinking tourism. Um, and then experimenting, like the, we, we have a Google Doc still open somewhere of, of planning this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, bringing, like getting the funding to bring enough representation of the Mallorcan system into the room for a three or four day pretty immersive event up in a special place here, a monastery up in the mountains. Um, and really inviting everybody saying, like, we found a funder that funds your place. You, so you, 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 those organizations that, that um, can't afford to pay for their own accommodation and food during that time, we even find that money. Mm -hmm. and, and, but we would want you to commit the time um, as your part of the, this, this process. Yeah. And and to basically run a sort of prototype of a of a more inclusive thriving places process that would bring in the the sort of conceptual framing and importance of bioregionalism um, and, and and resilience building in the context of climate change and all that, bring in the more subtle um, warm data experience that would open up people to the the more qualitative data, and and then after three days with them invite them to spend another day with us to really actively reflect on the process of their own learning in those three days in order to, to make it something that we can then develop a, a, a methodology um, together. And I'm, I'm mentioning it in part because I haven't completely given up of that vision and it would be so wonderful to have you as part of, of, of making this, um, it's probably would probably be a series of workshops here on Mallorca um, mm. happen. Um, basically, what happened was that that we all got busy with other things, and then COVID blocked any kind of getting sixty people into a room for three days and working in close proximity around tables. Um, so, so that's that's why it's either needs redesigning, but I still believe it, it would actually need to be in in physical um, presence. So we we have time until that's possible again but um i'd be delighted to be involved we're planning something similar down here in devon but online we're hoping to do it before the start of the tourist season because south devon depends on tourism as well but we've been completely overwhelmed i mean last summer we couldn't even get into the car parks for our favorite beaches because there were just so many people here and no doubt the same thing will happen again so we need to kind of in a way rethink tourism and what we want to do is kind of um, kickstart some projects at landscape scale. So really kind of thinking into the, um, the tourist ecosystems plus the natural ecosystems and offering different kinds of tourist experiences to people who come here, which will be um, hopefully experiences that regenerate place at the same time. But it's quite a challenge because it's, uh, people do depend on tourism for their livelihoods, of course. And to ask them to kind of rethink that is challenging. But we also want to try and keep money circulating in the local economy. So any kind of tourist interventions could, that can actually kind of foreground people who live locally and work locally and offer local experiences or, or local hospitality, we think that would be a good bonus as well. So I think we're on the same track here, Daniel. And I love the way that our minds are kind of sinking and going in the same yeah, direction. It's, it's high time that we had this conversation because yeah, we're for sure. clearly, clearly um, having the same impulse work through us um, in, in, yeah. in similar ways. Like, on, on the notion that, like, I'll send you the link afterwards. One of the projects um, I was part of here on Mallorca to do what you just, just because this, this conversation of how could we create a different type of tourism has been on Mallorca for a while, but... Um, mm -hmm but uh, not in, in the way with the urgency that it has now because of the, the crisis also of the tourism yeah. sector. But the, um, a few years back, probably about by now five, six years ago, I, I was invited by a local um, 
activator and activist um, who has a lot of good connections here on the island because he used to be the chief designer of Kemper Shoes. And um, Kemper is a Mallorcan company, yeah. quite a certain company, company here on the island, and the family owns not just Kemper, but also the other side of the family owns Ibero Star Hotels, which is um, a, a large hotel chain. And, and uh, Guillaume had this wonderful idea, um, and I'll send you the link, of reactivating the ancient pilgrimage routes that lead to this place that we wanted to do the thing that I just mentioned yeah. at, um, which is called Yuk in the mountains of Mallorca. And it, it's, it's now a santuario. It's, it, it has a black virgin and, and it's, it sort of it looks like a tem wow. Templar monastery. But um, it's um, actually the place where the earliest inhabitants of Mallorca, some 5,000 year, years ago, people came from Iberia in, on, on boats and, and settled on Mallorca. And um, they buried their dead or, or buried the ashes of their dead in a cave in, a, in the forest near that monastery. And mm -hmm. as, as good old Catholics like to take power spots and ancient places yes. and then stamp their Catholic stamp on it. Um, yeah. it, it, it the Yuk actually is Lucos, Bosque Sagrado, the Holy Forest. And so we, we created this project that there was pilgrimage routes from all sides of the islands back to the sacred forest and, and opening up, like there's one, which is the, the one that goes along the mountain range, the, the Tramontana, which had already been developed as a GR long distance European hiking route. Yeah. But, but there were actually, um, five more that come coming from the other sides of the island mm -hmm. all to yuk and um I'll, I'll send you the link it's it's a because also with with satish in devon and with the the wonderful work that that i'm sure you've been on one of stefan harding's um dartmoor walks or um and dartmouth walks along the coast um there already yeah. is a, a kind of neo pilgrimage tradition that is not denominational but is about walking lightly on the land and and re-inhabitational so to speak so so maybe one one interesting thing to explore is is a sort of um slow tourism of hiking routes through devon that connect these individual small tourism providers and and, and create a, a mm -hmm. so that's a lovely idea well yeah. having been here and lived here having studied at schumacher you'll know that the south devon is full of green lanes mm -hmm. So these are the old lanes that people used to walk in the days before metalled roads, whether they were kind of bringing fish from Brixham to Totnes or they're, you know, just walking to the next village. And I think we could do something around walks along the green lanes and kind of starting to connect them up. And I love the idea of the connecting them up to then to local businesses. That's a fantastic idea. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll send you the link to Kami the Yuk. It's a wonderful website. They did a beautifully artistic um kind of guide for people how to how to walk it, it then because of funders and be, it's a sort of you know how the three horizons framework sometimes h2 plus or h3 ideas get captured by horizon one there's yeah. a little bit of capture of this idea through horizon mm -hmm. one and commercialization of the Kamidi yuk but you you'll 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 see the heart in it and, mm -hmm. and it'll probably be quite quite useful as a sort of some, something to explore how, how you would adapt the, the, the idea to, to your place. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. And um, I mean, there's so many things that I would like to talk about, but I'm also always conscious that going over 90 minutes to, turns people, it's already the hardy ones who are willing to listen to a 90 minute conversation, <laughs> but over that people get a bit. So let me just see, I have made a few notes here. Uh, Maybe I read some of them out and you tell me you go go where you want to go because I, yeah. I wrote that down what are the river keepers um, and then also I saw that because we talked about Janine's uh, influence in the thriving places that you also have a bit of a biomimicry background and used to run um, secondary school programs for biomimicry so maybe the whole issue of learning from nature as nature rather than from nature as something else like how do we truly become expressions of um nature again um as we can't but be but we've sort of fallen out of scale and out of sync mm -hmm. and then um yeah because of your curation background i'm 
fascinated about this whole the, the use of festival and storytelling and the, the Archimedes yeah. Screw Festival that that you started. You, you pick where you want to go. <laughs> Great. Well, I'd love to dive into the art bit. That's a lovely right. imitation because that falls River Keepers into it. Mm -hmm. so for a long time, even before Bioregional Learning Centre became a formal organisation, we've been working with Water and the South Devon Catchments Partnership. And, and Water is still a theme that runs through our work. So, for instance, back in 2018, 2019, we made a charter for a part of our river which gave moral rights to the river. We wanted to flip the relationship between the local community and water from one of consuming to one of stewarding. And, and now we're planning a um, kind of festival along the dart, or Voices of the Dart, that will actually kind of, through lots of kind of creative experiences, particularly with sound, will give people the opportunity to kind of speak the, vo the voice of the dart itself. So speaking the historic voice of the dart, the present voice of the dart and all the issues around drought and flood and pollution, and also kind of thinking into the future, future of climate change and how we're going to negotiate that. So we think the arts are incredibly important. We kind of bring them back in whenever we can. And the River Keeper project uh, it was kind of born out uh, alongside the charter. The idea of that if you created a charter for your stretch of the river, which gave rights to the river and named the um, watery assets that the local community really valued and wanted to stand up for, that you would need a couple of river keepers in each community who would be like the eyes and ears of the river. So they'd be acting for the river and protecting those assets, but doing it obviously in a kind of informal way, but liaising nonetheless with the Environment Agency and Southwest Water and the South Devon Catchments Partnership. And from there, we were imagining some kind of river council at which all those bodies would be able to talk and make decisions together. And that's circling back to the whole notion of kind of common pool assets and common pool asset management, the work of Elena Ostrom. And um, it kind of brings us back to the commons. I'm not quite sure how the commons actually fits into what we're doing. As you know, we've got a big commons on Dartmoor. So that's the commons is becoming one of the themes of the book. Right. I think it's a vital aspect. I'm so glad that you bring up the commons because um, the guy, one of the projects here on Mallorca that, that is bubbling up at the moment is, is an initiative that was sort of pushed by a friend of mine um, early last year um, and that, that has started to inspire more and more people that we, we could actually make this happen. There's still a lot of complexity before, before we're there. But... Um, it's called Baleares Vert, and um, it, it's basically starting on the kind of ecosystems restoration, land restoration side of things, large landscape. Yes. Um, so very much linked, like I actually, we've, we've had a number of conversations with Common Land and Willem Verweder's group in the Netherlands. Um, yes. We've got this very good strategy of how, how to um, build over a 20 year timeline a, a project that has these four returns, the return of inspiration, the return of um, ecological capital, in doing those two social capital returns, and then with a little bit of time delay of about four to five years, economic capital returns to the region. And you need to sell that to funders in a new way of, of saying, this is a 20-year project, and funders aren't used to 20-year projects. And that, it, it, um, I think Common Land holds something really important there. and. Um, and with this particular project, we, we're, we're trying to find different landowners on the island that would put their land into the initial network of restoring the soils, replanting the forests, creating more diverse production systems for the island, weaving in the university. Like one of the landowners is the university, so one of the pilot projects might actually be the university campus. And, and I, I, in parallel to that, I feel that if we want to, and I, and there's, I can link you to a few people um, who are working on this. Yeah, okay. um, this, this, this notion of enabling a new form of investment that is an investment to gain um, quick returns, like most yes. people, make, but, but is actually enabling people to transfer land into a 
tr commons trust or land trust on yeah. on the bioregion at the bioregional scale and then possibly mm -hmm. even globally linked to a, a global commons trust so um based on a series of criteria and a series of over like some form of oversight committee yeah. um, you you then transfer money back out of this world that i think is like listening deeply to an indigenous wisdom around bioregionalism i think yeah. Yeah. One of the, and, and this for some reason it, it came to me in in a much stronger way in a conversation with um john fullerton on regenerative economics that i had um where it suddenly sort of all boiled down to the one place where we went wrong is when we thought we can own land rather than the land owns us the, the minute we we created a system on on this idea that land is a commodity to be owned we we lost the path of of our species of bioregioning being expressions and custodians and nurturers of healthy ecosystems in the land that that we came forth of that, that i completely land. agree i completely agree and it's property law i don't know what property law is like in mallorca but certainly mm. here in the uk i mean as you know kind of property is nine tenths of the law ownership's nine tenths of the law and so just kind of even thinking about our river dart which is our local river which we did made the charter for and we're starting the river keeper program on and creating the festival for like it's owned by probably about 50 different entities own it not just individual landowners but the church of england the prince of wales um you've got all sorts of kind of uh, riparian owners who own the fishing rights you've got dartmouth harbour and so on I mean, it's incredibly complicated. So that's a real barrier to kind of thinking holistically and acting holistically. So if you want to do something from source to sea, you have to involve all these different entities with a shared agreement, which is one reason why I think the arts is so powerful and so regenerative, because it can come in without seeming to be threatening in any way and create a celebration that does link all those people together. But I, I've been thinking more and more about how, how do we get around the fact that it's, it's law is really blocking us in our minds from thinking in this connected way. Yeah, and, and I think that there are, um, I'm thinking of a guy who helped to set up Ecolise, Claudian Dobos. He's, he's set up an organization in Portugal called Terra Livre, which is basically mm -hmm. a, a long-term um, regenerative land trust mm -hmm. that People, landowners could transfer the ownership to of, of their land, um, knowing that then then transferring their patrimony to a gremium that will will hold that land in regenerative attention for perpetuity for all of humanity. So so it's 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 basically people can still then run regenerative agriculture businesses on the land only if they manage the land regeneratively so that so, so basically you can have perpetuity you can even pass it on to from one generation to the next the the, the, the custodianship of the land but but the only thing is that you don't really own the land the land owns you and and in in the sense that as long as you're good to the land the land will will you're still allowed to 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 be the custodian yeah? And I think that I mean these 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 um, vehicles are fledgling in their experiments at this point, yeah, but, sure. but there are more and more people looking at this. Joe Brewer with with an initiative in Colombia is also yeah. um, experimenting with with some kind of land trust that that he's trying to set up. And um, similarly, here on Mallorca we already have a land bank, but that's slightly different. That's land owners that would potentially give their land to somebody who wants to work the land. But it's it's a step. Um, because often that also happens that people inherit land, but they don't want to be farmers, and and mm -hmm. so it, it, they yeah. let it go to abandonment. Um, yeah, but it, I think that that whole how do we really create a wise way of subtly, like in a Buckminster Fuller, make the build the the new system that makes the old obsolete kind of approach, yeah. subtly allow those who are ready to transfer the ownership of land into a commons pool that is safeguarded over future generations by a set of very strong principles and processes that ensure that that 
if you do make that donation of land, a bit like that Tompkins did with large parts of, of um, Chile and, and Argentina, um, you ensure that, that the land is actually um, managed regeneratively. Um, yeah. I think that's a wonderful idea. We do need to manage land at landscape scale, for sure. And the, I think one of the challenges, to come back to <clears throat> the finance aspect, is how you express the return on landscape investing. So I've been looking for some time to find somebody who could sit down with me and kind of figure that bit out. But maybe that's the line you're working down, that, Daniel. For that, I think that the, the person who's really doing the data and uh, on that is, is Willem Verweda and Commonland. Um, oh, okay. beginning, so so um, if you haven't looked into that more detail, like that in, this, in, in this series um, that, that we're just recording an um, ex example of, and there's a, I'll send you the link. There's a conversation I had with Willem um, in October or so of last year. Okay. It might be a good way to start uh, as an introduction to just listen to that. Um, and um, I can also send you the link to a book that he wrote on the four returns while he was working within the Rotterdam Business School, very strategically planting that publication in a business environment. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I think that they're really beginning to because one of the, the things that their process also addresses is something that we mentioned earlier, the role of the weaver, how important it is yes. to bring people together, how, how it takes time and effort, and it needs to be resourced to create the, in, in Regenesis' words, create the field yeah, yes, for regeneration yes. to happen. Absolutely. And, and, and Common Land, I think he, he picked something off the shelf that was the next best thing and, uh, and is, good, is a good process and, and had a recognition already. So he, they're working with the ULAB um, approach, but, but, but they, they very clearly um, tell their funders, A, don't bother funding us unless you're in it for 20 years, which is mm -hmm. pretty gutsy. Um, and they're also saying, you have to understand that in order to start this process, we need to start with the return of inspiration and through the focus on returning ecological capital and, and social capital. And that means that initially we need to pump prime this quite significantly. And, 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 and he didn't have, like he didn't cut himself short by basically the, the project that they're already running in, in Spain, in the Murcia region. Mm -hmm. And they've invested half a million euros a year in the first four years to bring the multi-stakeholder alliance that is now called the Asociación Alvalal um, together in order to, to, to come up with a plan of landscape scale regeneration there. Um, and so, so yeah, for, for me, that's, that's one of the, the, the good models to, to dive into. Um, I would definitely look at that. Anyway, this is the, this is, must be the beginning of a, a, a series of conversations. We're, 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 we're so clearly, Thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're so clearly um, inspired to to bring this kind of work to the regions we inhabit, and and yeah. the, this is the kind of mutual learning I think that that could be really fruitful to have if we keep having yes a check in every even if it's every two or three months but but it just uh, so we don't make it another two years like between yeah no, i quite agree Daniel. and i would love to see and others would love to see a kind of european network of bioregions start to form so that we could become a learning network yeah i'd love to talk to you about that let's 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 make it happen and let's, let's, let's uh, happen. without without because you said your focus of attention has to be South Devon, and my focus of attention has to be Mallorca. <laughs> but but we still need to do the learning, and and also we it's through that European network that we can then begin to um, access the the vast amounts of money that are currently being put into some kind of recovery plan. And and, and here on Mallorca, we're we're beginning to have that conversation, um, also with the tourism industry now. More right. and more players are beginning to to look at the, this meme that I planted here. 10 years ago of Mallorca could be a real, because there's so much European attention and even international attention to this island. Yeah. It is a kind of scale that is, is manageable. Half a million people city in a million people island, roughly, it's a little bit less mm -hmm. in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Mallorca could be a case study for how this is possible. And, Definitely. and but, but it would be much richer if it combined with a Dev, South Devon bioregion or, or Jenny Anderson's doing something in, in, in Sussex that is going into that direction. There's a number of, of people yes. on, on the map for that. 
Definitely. Great. So thank you so much for this. And, and I, I wish we could continue, but we'd ha would have to start another recording and maybe we'll do it some other time. <laughs> That's and okay. We'll keep talking, Daniel. That was a real pleasure. Very stimulating conversation. Thank Likewise. you. Likewise. Lots of love and, and yep. love. Like, thank care. you so much for the inspiration and leadership you're, you're demonstrating. Um, like, for me, it's a great um, inspiration. And I, I actually feel like maybe the step is to, to how, how would you feel if I set up a bioregional learning center, Mallorca, and, and actually um, so linked to your name? Uh, yeah, fantastic. We need learning centers all over. Because I love the name. It's just, the, it's the right humility and the, the right process. Um, it's, it's got a gerund in it. It's, an, it's a process. It's a verb. Um, yeah. yeah. I, thank we, you so much. We need them everywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Take care.